All right, back on Morning Line. It's our uh, final uh, segment this morning. If you want to jump in, 737-7587, ask a sheriff. Darren Hall's with us from uh, the Davidson County Sheriff's Office. Also, Jim Gondel's with us, Executive Director of the American Corrections Association. Um, about 80 of uh, his uh, correctional officers will be going through training this week to deal with uh, mental health issues in the jail, which is a great thing. And we talked about um, suicides. One high profile case before we get to the phone calls that I wanted to touch base is on the former New England Patriots tight end, Aaron Hernandez, who uh, committed suicide. I guess this was, it was in a jail in Massachusetts, I, I think. It was. I think. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's some question from his attorneys about let's investigate it. I think it seems pretty clear that this was a suicide. What, what did you think when you initially heard about this? And it's high profile, so everyone was talking about it. You know, I um, there are some interesting parts of this compared to at least my, my experience with it. One is he had received very good news recently. Yeah, it just was acquitted in two murders. Yeah, and you're usually suicide watch for us or, you know, usually major events that are usually going negative where you're trying to, or some indication that there may be something else going on. So you would assume that he had received the you know, And he the was not on suicide watch, right? Yeah, because right. of that. As far yeah. as I know, I've had people ask that question. He was know. still serving a life sentence. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's he was right. never going to get out of prison. Yeah. Right, right. But his attorney had said, based on these acquittals, we're going to use some of the same strategy in our appeal. Of, I'm just saying, there, for the first time, maybe in his mind was some hope. So it was a little strange to me that, but who knows what's going on in right. his head because right. this guy is a stone cold killer. But, but I think, Nick, I do think it's worth pointing out that it, it is extremely challenging to prevent someone from harming themselves that is committed to doing that. Now, we may stop you tonight, and we may stop you tomorrow, we may try, but it is extremely, I could, I could spend the rest of the show talking about some of the more creative things that mm -hmm. have happened in our system. One of the more, it was on the national news, really. We had a guy, just, I don't have time to deal with the whole thing, but a guy who, who committed suicide laying down um, and, and had a device set up where water would drain into a bucket. The bucket created the weight. The weight tightened a metal thing around his throat. He was a federal inmate. I've never seen anything like it because our officers were doing bed checks as they were supposed to, and he was sleeping. But the whole time that was going on, he had water that was draining into it. Yeah, and it just, so in, in this case, he, he, he wedged the door, I believe, wedged the mm, door to, to give himself a few more minutes. And I, I, I don't... I'm not saying that we shouldn't do everything we can to prevent it and stop. We all try and hope to do that. I mean, it's never talked about, but those staff that worked with this inmate, Her Hernandez or our staff, go through a traumatic event themselves. And what sure. we've always tried to do is to try to prepare them not only to identify it, but how to deal with what they feel is a, is a sense of failure and loss. And, and they experience a, a, a traumatic mm -hmm. event mm -hmm. themselves. So we, we want to stop it, but, but it is very difficult when, when you have a person, and again, this is unique to me. This because of the news and the timing, uh, you know, my, my, the, the profile of a suicide in jail is a young, white, recently arrested, fairly low level charges, isolated. First 72 hours. First, and, and so what we, we need to do, as Jim mentioned, is the isolation is a real big deal. It and is. corrections historically used to take someone and get them away from everybody. Exactly. But now we need to realize that environments where we're all here together is much safer for the individual people don't harm themselves in front of someone else. Yeah. And so, there's others to see if he's going to right, harm himself right. to sound the alarm. Let's take a call from Lane. Lane, good morning. Hi, Lane. Hi. Hey, go ahead. Yes, I would like to ask the sheriff. Now, this is about juvenile. I hope he can help me. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I've told my story several times. My little granddaughter was 11 when this 12-year-old boy murdered her. Okay, he was found guilty of murder. Okay, he was uh, sentenced in December. He was sent to Nashville. We had an evaluation this March, uh, which would have been, I think, 30 days. Okay, then the judge said we don't go back until September for another evaluation. Okay, we get a phone call Friday saying... Uh, he may get out for home visits in March, I mean in May, and of course we'll, he'll have a hearing on that. And there's a possibility he may get out for good in September. How old is he now? He is 13 because Sienna was 12, mm -hmm. August, I mean, uh, May, April the 8th. Okay. Wow. Yeah. And this happened where? Franklin County. 
Franklin County. Yeah, y'all aired it. Yeah, I think I recall. That's just an awful, wow. awful situation. Lena, I'm going to let the sheriff answer the question, and then I'm going to put you on hold. And if Mary Elena um, can, and Rick can get your phone number, I'd like to talk more to you about it. All right? Uh, yes, I okay. would love that. Stay on the stay on the line. She's on line one. We'll see if we can get her number. But I don't know That's if you have a, any thoughts on that. Yeah, those are extremely complicated cases. Yes. I, I think you did the right thing by following up with it because. Those with juvenile law, of course, is different, but just is such a complicated issue uh, when you're talking about someone that young. What a tragic Well, story. think about it. The whole concept of then transferring a child to adult system and, right. and whether or not someone that young would somehow end up in your right. care. How, where would you put a 13-year-old? Yeah, we've done And that. then sometimes that happens now. Yeah, we've done that yeah. before. It is a very difficult situation. Um, if you're, there's two things to think about. If you're tried and convicted as an adult, even though he was 12 years old, that can happen. It mm -hmm. just, it, the court has to do that. Court has to move it to a juvenile court has to move that case to an adult uh, mm -hmm. adjudication. If that happens and he is convicted as an adult, even though he's 12 or 13, then we would house him. Now, would he not stay in like some kind of juvenile custody yes. until he got a certain age, and then he goes to no. you, or he's all of a sudden over there in the big boy jail? Yeah, he comes. Yeah, I mean, this is not funny, but we have 18-year-old birthdays a lot, um, mm -hmm. and, and historically, and we, we've moved some of them back to juvenile court just for housing under our construction, but. The truth of the matter is, when they say to be bound over as an adult and convicted as an adult, they, they move to the local jail setting. And so, but I would, I would really want to caution anything I would say because Franklin County and how they handle that in juvenile there, I don't yeah. want to mess up her. Yeah, I'll, your, I'll your follow story up on that. I do remember when it, it's just a horrible story. Let's, let's go to Charles. Charles, good morning. Yes, I would like to ask Shell Hall, according to Jeff Blum, when you're unmedicated and homeless, you're 10 times more likely to go to jail than to the hospital. Mm. But a hospital is not a disciplinary environment. It's a place to get well. Jail is where you're charged with a crime, with the balls, the jumpsuits, with the correctional clothes. So if a mental patient is charged with a crime, why can't we force them to take their medication and make them less violent when you can force them to take medication in the hospital setting? That's a great question. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Great, great How question. Yeah. yeah, Charles is right on. I mean, uh, there, there's two options. You pull up and there's a person who's mentally ill. You can take them to the hospital or you can take them to jail. What, what Charles needs to know, which I didn't realize until just uh, maybe three years ago, that the number one reason a mentally ill person comes to jail is because they're wanted for going for failing probation or failing court dates or whatever. We should never have placed people who are mentally ill on the expectation of completing probation. Right. You'll never make so it. They're not gonna show up. So so yeah. it, it's the reason they're arrested, and he brings this up, is not because the police are using inappropriate discretion, which is kind of what a lot of people thought. It's because we've asked of them something they never could have completed in the first place. We being the criminal justice system. Our mission, our goal is to have that person out of the system and decriminalize it altogether and never put them back on probation. Our new, our new facility we're building, when a person is brought here, the criminal justice system will excuse or race their criminal justice activity if they will complete the treatment of mental health and therefore you won't be going back out on probation or court dates to follow up and you won't be ultimately uh, failing a program you'll never you know uh, succeed that so he's right I mean we should mm -hmm. be able to have a choice of a hospital but you don't have that because the police pull up I have a warrant for Jim Gondles Jim Gondles must go with me the police don't really have a choice let's take a call and uh, I think we got time for one more Roger good morning Roger good morning how you doing good Rog what's on your mind um, I just have a, a quick question for the sheriff um, I would like, well, actually I have two. Uh, the first question is, um, I know the inmates, they just received the tablets, and I was just wondering, uh, does the tablets eliminate the fall problem for the inmates uh, when they're locked up? And also, um, I wanted to ask him, um, could you explain real quick the difference between the police and the sheriff, like what their duties are? <laughs> okay, real quick. You have three minutes. Um, uh -huh. and, you know, it's different. As he's right, in Davidson County, it is different. It's not always different in other counties. But right. uh, you go ahead. Yeah, that's a great question. My mom asks this question a lot. Uh, <laughs> sometimes people ask her. And, and um, yeah, so so we metropolitan government in, in 52 years ago um, basically said that the police chief and the sheriff cannot do the same things. We both have the same authority, but we can't duplicate our jobs. So it's been over the many years uh, worked out that, that what they do is primarily make the arrest in the streets, the traffic and the investigative arrest. We do all of the, the civil warrant processing and we do all of the housing and, and custody of every arrestee. Um, I've been around the country. I think it's the best form of government. Uh, there shouldn't be, although people are confused, I understand that. Mm -hmm. But there's no confusion to us. We do not, uh, our, our staff aren't pulling people over 
and nor is the police officer coming in the booking room and, and, and harassing or involving themselves with the person they just arrested. So it's a pretty clean break, I think, and, and it, I think it helps us do our job better and it should help the police do their job better. Roger brings up the tablets. We're, we rolled out tablets for every inmate, basically like an iPad. Um, um, we did that uh, several months back and it's, it's out there now. I think you did a story and mm -hmm. you guys. Yeah, it's very successful uh, for us. Uh, it gives them information, readily available programming, health information, uh, visitation, phones. He asked, does it replace the phone? It serves as, a, as the individual's phone. Um, so more of those big long lines. That right, and no yeah. fighting over the phones, not a lot of fighting over the TV. They can download what they, what we approve, everything that they see. They don't have access to the internet. They can't go surf. They can't communicate with a victim. But the truth is, my son, I have a 23-year-old son, if he were to go to jail today, he wouldn't know how to go over on the phone and dial on the <laughs> phone and call me. That's not how that generation lives. And so we're trying to make it more accessible to, to maintain relationships in the community because it's important for their release that they have continuous relationship. Yeah. You know, in Tennessee, the, the fact that the metro government is set up the way it is makes, I think, your, you know, your office ideal to deal with what we're going to be doing with this because you're, you're exclusively focused on right. this and, and, and managing the, uh, the jail facility. So what will be great is if you come back down the road here after it's in place for a while and crack the whip if he doesn't stick to the all plan. right i will you crack the whip on him and then we want to see the track record as they, if, if, right. if all this goes right. as planned this week and we're going to have a news story on this later tonight because they're going to let us see some of the training um if it's all in place then we'll be able to get a feel for this getting started in the next few months yeah just a simple one nick i want to see the reduction in use of force okay yeah. we don't want to see force see used and we believe our staff should reduce the number of use of force and you're almost certain in your mind based Based on what you've heard, it's, that's going to be one of the results of this. We're, we're committed to making yeah. sure that that happens. I think it is. Listen, Jim, thank you for coming out. Nice Pleasure to be here. Pleasure having you here, and I uh, hope this certainly works. Sheriff, good to see you. Sir. Thank you, Nick. We'll thank see you, you again well. soon, all right? Sure will. Take a break. Programming note about tomorrow right after this. Stay with us. Thanks, guys.